Hi, Andre here from the MSAG team. The three C's of medical ethics are a great foundation and reference point for ethical questions during your medical school interview. This video will give you a summary of confidentiality, capacity, and consent, and how you can use these to strengthen your answers. Timestamps in the description below. Welcome to our video on the three C's. So you've likely just heard about the four pillars of medical ethics. Well, it's important not to forget about the three C's, confidentiality, capacity, and consent. These three important parts of medical practice also need to be considered when asked about your opinion on an ethical scenario. Medical schools have ethical stations to assess how you would respond to an ethical situation as a future doctor. Having some knowledge of the three C's will really help you out here as they govern many of the actions which you'll take in these sorts of situations. In this video, we'll go through each of the three C's in turn and talk through some examples of their use in medical practice. Before we begin, we'd recommend that you watch our video on the four ethical pillars to complete your knowledge on medical ethics, if you haven't already done so. So let's get started. Let's kick off with confidentiality. Now you probably have some idea of what confidentiality is already, but just to make sure, we'll begin with a definition. In healthcare, confidentiality refers to the obligation of professionals who have access to patient records or other information to hold that information in confidence. Essentially, the privilege of being able to ask patients about personal issues comes with the principle of keeping it secret. However, this does not just apply to health conditions, but all personal information about a patient. Can you imagine if you went and told your GP something that you found really embarrassing only to overhear him talking about it to someone else later that day. I'm sure you'd feel a whole wave of emotions at that point, probably hurt, anger and shock. Would you want to tell something personal to this GP ever again? I hope you're starting to see just how important confidentiality is to the doctor-patient relationship and why breaching confidentiality is never something we do lightly. However, there are times when we do need to break confidentiality. Can you think of any? Well, they tend to be when the patient is given their permission to break confidentiality, when we're required to break confidentiality by law, or when there's a risk to the health of the public or the patient. Possible scenarios of when we can break confidentiality as medical professionals because a patient has put the public at risk include a person knowingly risking the spread of HIV or an epileptic patient driving when they shouldn't be. In instances where it's been decided that confidentiality should be broken, we would usually inform the patient first, as this can help to maintain the doctor-patient relationship. These cases are often difficult to deal with, and decisions to break confidentiality would usually involve discussing the case with a senior colleague or your defence union first. Our next seat to cover is capacity. Capacity is an individual's ability to make an informed decision. A patient must have capacity in order to give informed consent for a procedure or treatment. So it's sort of a big deal, really. The Mental Capacity Act of 2005 expands on this definition by saying that a person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time he or she is unable to make a decision for himself or herself in relation to the matter because of an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the brain or the mind. That's fairly lengthy, so let's break it down to what it means for everyday medical practice. First, we need to find out if there's an impairment of the mind. Now this could be anything from dementia to acute alcohol intoxication, among many other things. Once we've established that there may be an issue, then we need to find out how it's impacting on the patient's ability to make the decision. This can be broken down into four key questions. First, can they understand the information given to them? Then can they weigh up the information for long enough to be able to make a decision? Can they weigh up the pros and cons of the information? And finally, can they communicate their decision by any means? The important thing to remember about capacity is that it's decision and time specific. For example, 
Imagine one of your friends drinks too much alcohol and you have to take her to hospital because she's hit her head while falling over. She doesn't want to be examined in A&E and just wants to be left alone. In this instance, do you think she has the capacity to make that decision? Likely not in this case, because at this point in time, it's unlikely that she can logically weigh up the pros and cons of the decision at hand. Now consider your friend stays in hospital overnight and she wants to discharge herself in the morning, even though some of her tests are still outstanding. By this point, the alcohol level in her blood has reduced to the point where you're confident she can weigh up the pros and cons of discharging herself and her head injury doesn't seem to have caused her any lasting issues. At this point, she probably does have the capacity to make the decision to self-discharge. This example demonstrates that just because she didn't have capacity the night before doesn't mean that she will continue to lack capacity throughout her admission. One final and really important point regarding capacity is that everybody is assumed to have capacity unless proven otherwise. Therefore, just because someone has dementia, a mental health condition or a learning disability does not automatically mean that they do not have capacity. And even if they do lack capacity for healthcare matters, they may still have the capacity to make other decisions, such as what to have for dinner, for example. We've gotten to our final C, consent. Now we've just mentioned that you need capacity in order to give consent. But what specifically is consent? It means giving permission for something to happen. In medical practice, consent should be obtained for all types of medical care delivered to the patient. For example, this can range from something as simple as an examination of the lungs to a complex heart operation. Now, if every time I wanted to examine a patient or take a blood test, I needed to have written consent from my patient, this would take forever. For this reason, we have three different types of consent. Implied, verbal and written. An example of implied consent is when I go up to pick up my blood pressure cuff and my patient offers out their arm for the blood pressure to be taken. From the action of offering their arm, I can tell that they understand what I'm about to do and are happy to proceed. For other simple procedures, we often just ask the patient if it's okay to perform the procedure. This is known as verbal consent. For example, I could say to my patient, do you mind if I take some blood from you for testing? And finally, if you've ever had any kind of operation or more risky procedure, you'll know that we get patients to go through a consent form with us. This outlines all the risks and benefits which the doctor performing the procedure and the patient must both sign before proceeding. The final thing to know about consent is that there are three specific things which are needed in order for it to be valid. Wow, this video has a lot of threes in it. Three C's, three different types of consent, and finally, the three necessities of consent. Firstly, consent must be voluntary. It seems quite self-explanatory, right? When wouldn't it be voluntary? Well, how about if we had an elderly patient consenting to sell her house and moving into a residential home because she was being pressured by her family? Or a woman being told by her partner to have an abortion, even though she doesn't want to? Determining whether consent is voluntary is sometimes a little trickier than it first appears. The next thing consent needs to be is informed. Say you needed to have heart bypass surgery. Do you consent to it? Well, how can you when your doctor hasn't told you anything about the procedure? You'll want to know why you need it, what the benefits are, and what are the risks. The point is that in order to make a decision about a procedure, the patient needs to be informed of all of the necessary information and it's the doctor's duty to tell them of this before they consent. This is why you'll often hear the term informed consent being used. Finally, as we've already mentioned, in order to consent to something, you have to have the capacity to make that decision. Well done, you've made it to the other side of the three C's. I hope this video has helped you to see how these issues crop up in everyday clinical practice and why they need to be thought about when encountering ethical scenarios. Welcome back and thanks for watching. Hopefully now you've mastered the basics of the three C's. For more information on how to approach ethical questions or scenarios, check out our brand new online interview resource. Link in the description. 
you found this video helpful, please leave a like. And if you want to see more medical school admissions content, then subscribe to our channel. We put out new videos every week. Best of luck on your admissions.